part of that, yeah. Good move. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Pardon me. Um, and welcome to the McLaren Independent Commission News Conference here in Toronto. My name is Catherine Doyle. I'll be uh, your MC for today. Uh, in May, Professor McLaren was mandated by the World Anti-Doping Agency to lead a multidisciplinary team charged with determining the facts with respect to the allegations of manipulation of doping control samples and other allegations made by Dr. Grigory Vodchenkov, the former director of, WADA, of the WADA accredited Moscow Laboratory. Today we are here to listen to the results of his investigation. With me today is Professor McLaren. He is one of the world's foremost experts in ethics in sports and international sports law. He is a law professor at the University of Western Ontario and the CEO of McLaren Global Sports Solutions. He is also a longstanding member of the Court of Arbitration of Sport for Sports and a member of the three-person independent commission that looked at allegations of widespread doping in international athletics. Joining Professor McLaren is Martin Dubby, who is the chief investigator of the team and he will be here to help answer questions. So without further ado, I would like to turn it over to Professor McLaren. Uh, thank you very much, Catherine. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming today. For the investigative team, it's been a very intense 57 days. And I'm very proud that we have accomplished in such a short period of time. Uh, the hours have been long, and I wish to thank each member of the investigative team for their hard work, professionalism, and dedication. Let me begin by saying that I'm honored to have been asked to lead this investigation. It comes on the heels of the previous work uh, that I did uh, in the world of international sports law, and most recently as a member of the three-person independent commission that was tasked with looking into doping in Russian athletics. Uh, by way of background to my remarks, you will likely all know that in May of 2016, the New York Times published an article in which the former director of the Moscow uh, testing laboratory, Grigory uh, Rodoshenkov, made allegations of sample manipulation. That was the catalyst that brought about the creation of this independent inquiry. The World Anti-Doping Agency mandated me as an independent person to look into allegations to determine the true facts. My mandate was not limited to only the published allegations. My work included looking into and reporting on any other information or evidence that materialized throughout the course of the investigation. And there has been a lot. I want to turn for a moment to the rules of evidence that we used in respect of producing this report. I was appointed to uh, lead the investigation to ensure that the, it was an unbiased and independent examination of the evidence so that all stakeholders could have confidence in the outcomes. From the outset of our investigation, our goal has been to ensure our findings, to hold up the highest standards of scrutiny, and <clears throat> only present evidence that meets the criminal law concept of beyond a reasonable doubt. I'm also committed to demonstrating as much transparency as possible without compromising the confidentiality of the individuals who shared information and evidence with me and my investigative team. We've conducted interviews, secured data from hard drives, revol sorry, revived deleted documents, reviewed thousands of pages of documents, employed cyber analysis, conducted cyber and forensic analysis of metadata, requested urine sample uh, laboratory analysis of individual athlete samples. 
and directed experiments on urine, urine sample collection bottles. The investigation has established the findings set out in the report beyond a reasonable doubt. The evidence we've uncovered is all verifiable and can be cross-corroborated by multiple sources. I'm unwaveringly confident in our report. I've provided my report to the President of the World Anti-Doping Agency. And today at this press conference, I'll provide an overview of our main findings. The full report contains many more details of our investigation, and I encourage you to read it in its entirety. And as for these remarks that I'm delivering right now, they'll be available to all of you uh, after the press conference. I want to turn to the main findings. Our commission of investigation uncovered the following. First, the, Mas the Moscow laboratory operated for the protection of doped Russian athletes within a state-directed fail-safe system, which we describe in the report as the disappearing positive methodology. Second, the Sochi laboratory operated a unique sample swapping methodology to enable doped Russian athletes to compete at the Winter Olympic Games. Third, the Russian Ministry of Sport directed, controlled, and oversaw the manipulation of athletes' analytical results, or sample swapping, and the active participation and assistance of the FSB, CSB, and both Moscow and Sochi laboratories. For those of you who may not know, the FSB is the Russian Federal Security Service, formerly known as the KGB, and the CSP is the Center of Sports Preparation of National Teams of Russia. And those two bodies were directly involved in the state-directed control and oversight and manipulation of athletes' analytical results. I also want to emphasize from those three key findings that Russian athletes competing in a wide range of disciplines were involved. This is not just about what we in North America call track and field and others call athletics. Uh, it covers many sports. Let me give you the details that support those three main findings. And let me start with the Moscow Laboratory, in particular the disappearing positive methodology. Upon embarking on our investigation, we soon discovered a wider means of concealing positive doping results than what had been described for Sochi in the New York Times article. We uncovered a system that ensured if any of the elite performing athletes who were doped did not achieve protection by the various in the field mechanisms in place during the sample collection and transportation process and previously described by the three-person investigation committee, then their doping would be covered up at the laboratory stage. The Moscow lab's disappearing positive methodology, as we've dubbed it, was the state's fail-safe strategy. <clears throat> the system was set up after Russian authorities felt was an abysmal medal count by the Russian Olympic team at the 2010 Vancouver Winter Olympics and was in place until at least August of 2015. In essence, the disappearing positive methodology allowed transformation of positive analytical results into a negative one by an order from the Deputy Minister of Sport that the operational analytical processes of the Moscow Laboratory be altered and a false record filed with WADA and in the laboratory records. Ministry of Sport, RUSADA, that's the doping agency in Russia, anti-doping agency in Russia, and the CSP were all involved in this operation. It was a simple but effective and efficient method for Deputy Minister of Sport Yuri Nagarov 
to force the lab to report any positive finding as a negative result. Laboratory staff were under strict instructions to report all positives to the Ministry of Sport, whatever the circumstances. From late 2011 onwards, the Ministry would be informed through a liaison person who would advise Mr. Nagornik of every positive analytical finding in the Moscow lab, including the athlete's name. This information would be passed up the chain of command uh, and involved every sports discipline. The order then would come back, save, quarantine. If the order was a save, lab personnel would report the samples as negative in what is anti-doping management system, which is known as ATOMS, and falsify the result in the laboratory information management system operated by the lab itself. ATOMS is an online global database maintained by WADA. If the order was quarantine, the athlete's positive results would proceed to be processed in accordance with the WADA International Standard for Laboratories. The investigative team has captured the data for a total of 577 positive screening reports. On the review by the investigative team, we have determined that the Ministry of Sport ordered a save in 312 cases and a quarantine in 265 cases of that slice of data that we have. In the course of our work, we began also to notice a pattern in the communications involving foreigners. Most foreigners' orders were quarantined. In an email chain that the investigative team uncovered during the 2013 Moscow Championships, the order was clear. All foreigners, quarantine. Based on athlete profile evidence, we found that 87% of foreign athletes were given a quarantine. Dr. Rodoshenkov and other witnesses described the system to the investigative team in interviews. My team has reviewed and validated hundreds of emails, communications of all sorts, digital media communications, along with forensic analytical findings and experiments, and can demonstrate the existence of this system beyond a reasonable doubt. The disappearing positive methodology was in operation in the Moscow lab continuously. In particular, it operated during th these Russian world sports events, the IAAF championships in Moscow in 2013, the World University Games in Kazan in 2013, the FINA World Championships in 2015, and in the course of the preparation of the Russian Olympic team leading up to the London 2012 Olympics. Let me turn from the Moscow lab to the Sochi lab and the sample swapping at the Sochi Olympics. The disappearing positive methodology worked well to cover up doping, except that international events, where a number of international independent observers would be present, such as would occur at the Winter Olympics and the Paralympics in Sochi in 2014. For Sochi, the Russians needed a new, different methodology. The, same sample the sample swapping methodology was developed and applied. The main issue to overcome was the tamper-evident caps of the sample bottles. Could they be opened and resealed without visible evidence? The FSB took on this project. They developed a method for surreptitiously removing the caps of the bottles for use at Sochi. As a result, there were no positive samples at the Sochi Sochi Games for Russian athletes. Now, my investigative team's forensic evidence establishes beyond a reasonable doubt 
that some method was used to replace positive dirty samples during the Sochi Games. The FSB was the party who did that, and they're a secret organization, and no witness actually saw this occur. However, assisted by my forensic experts, my team conducted our own experiments. Those experiments, the penultimate ones, demonstrated personally in front of me, can, I can confirm that the caps of urine sample bottles can be removed without any evidence visible to the untrained eye. I also want to stress that our scratch and marks expert, as we called him, can and did detect evidence of tampering on the inside of bottle caps from all Sochi sample bottles we examined. So the first fundamental step uh, was in place. The rest of the scheme followed. You need a source of clean urine from which to draw urine samples for swapping. Through the coordinating efforts of the CSP, Russian athletes were instructed to collect what were thought to be clean urine samples outside of the washout periods for any performance enhancing drugs they were using. These samples were stored in a freezer at the CSP. Dr. Rodachenkov tested some of these samples to ensure they were uh, not going to be positive. The samples were subsequently transported secretly by the FSB from Moscow to the FSB storage freezer in their building located next to the Sochi lab where they sat waiting for the games to begin. The swapping occurred largely as described in the New York Times article. During the night, the samples were passed through what the IP team called a mouse hole from the lab inside the secure perimeter to an adjacent operations room outside the perimeter. From there, the sample bottles would be taken from the operations room. Now the idea of this mouse hole and the implementation of it uh, was accomplished by the combined activity of the second in charge of the Moscow lab and by the FSB in a secret operation. The clean urine from an athlete involved in the day's competition would be withdrawn from the SS FSB freezer and brought to the operations room to thaw out. Sample bottle would be returned by an FSB officer, open and with the cap removed. At this point in the operations room, Dr. Rodachenkov and his team would go to work. The dirty urine would be disposed of and replaced with clean urine. The protected athlete's clean urine was adjusted for specific gravity by adding table salt or distilled water. And this step was necessary to ensure that the swapped clean sample had a specific gravity that was as close as possible to what was recorded on the doping control form, which would have been completed at the time of the original collection at the competition site at the Sochi Games. The cap would be resecured and the bottles would be passed back through the mouse hole into the secure perimeter inside the lab, ready to be tested by the lab staff the following morning. To verify all of that, the investigative team chose 95 samples. We did so from a list of protected athletes, selected certain Russian medal winners, and from other information that we had. The IP investigative team randomly selected from that 95, 11 sample bottles <coughs> that had been stored in the Lausanne lab. The, the identified samples were then sent to the London lab, and our experts were to determine if there were scratches and marks on the inside of the bottle caps. We were able to confirm that all 11 samples had scratches and marks on the inside of the bottle caps, representative of a tool used to open the cap. 
Of the set of samples that I suspected of being swapped, 100% had evidence of tapering. So in addition to that, that claim that these caps had been removed and then reinserted, Dr. Rodoshenkov also claimed that the dirty urine was swapped with clean urine. How did that happen? Our laboratory analytical testing established that some samples had salt levels in excess of what is found in a hu healthy human urine analysis, thereby confirming interview evidence that salt had been added. Of course, that could only have taken place if original caps had been removed and then later resealed on the bottle. I want to emphasize that Sochi was a unique situation, needed because the presence of the international community in the lab required that they do something different than the disappearing positive methodology. What it did is it enabled Russian athletes to compete while doping, so competing dirty, being certain that their samples would be reported as clean. Let me turn to our other third principle finding, the state controlled and directed program. The prior uh, independent commission exposed state involvement in the manipulation of the doping program operated by RUSADA and within Russian athletics. The IP team's investigation adds a deeper understanding to the scheme exposed by the IC and presents proof of state-directed oversight and operational interference in the operations of the Moscow Lab's analytical work. We have found that the Center for Sports Preparation for National Teams, the CSP, played a routine and regular role in the disappearing positive methodology and sample swapping at Sochi. The two liaisons for the disappearing positive methodology were officials with the Ministry of Sport and the CSP. The CSP deputy director oversaw the collection of clean urine samples in 2013 for their storage and transportation to the FSB building in Sochi. The Deputy Minister of Sport, Yuri Nagornov, is the person who determined which positive samples reported by the liaisons person would be saved or quarantined. Dr. Redeshenkov's evidence is that in several of his regular meetings with the Deputy Minister, he was told that the Minister of Sport, Vitaly Mutko, was aware of everything that they were discussing. Dr. Rodoshenkov's testimony is that it is inconceivable that the Minister Mutko was not aware of the doping cover-up scheme. The FSB is the successor of the KGB and has responsibility for all security operations at home and abroad. Our investigation had identified roles played by three FSB personnel in the operations of both the Moscow and Sochi labs. The FSB role in the doping program is not interference and control like that of the Deputy Minister of Sport, but rather assistance in arranging and operating the state-sponsored system. The FSB developed the method to remove the caps of the sample bottles in Sochi. In addition, the FSB had working and sleeping quarters at least one FSB officer who had access to the Sochi lab as an accredited person under the guise of being a sewage and plumbing employee of the building maintenance contractor can be identified in the evidence we have. From all of this comes a picture which emerges of an intertwined network of state involvement through the Ministry of Sport and through the CSP and with the FSB in the operations of both Moscow and Sochi labs. It was a fail-safe method of permitting cheating Russian athletes to compete while using performance-enhancing substances. Just let me turn to a conclusion following those three key findings and a little bit further explanation of them. I'd like to stress I am supremely confident in our findings. 
We have evidence from interviews, documents, forensic analysis, and testing that supports our findings. And we have only considered evidence that is beyond a reasonable doubt, and the evidence in the report is all meets that standard. The Moscow Laboratory operated for the protection of doped Russian athletes, a state-directed fail-safe system which we described as the disappearing positive methodology. The methodology affected every single positive the lab reported and therefore applies across all sports. The Sochi Laboratory operated a unique sample swapping methodology to enable doped Russian athletes to compete at the games. The sample swapping, swapping methodology was used on a few other occasions, but the primary one is the uh, disappearing positive methodology. The Russian Minister of Sport directed, controlled, and oversaw the manipulation of athletes' analytical results or sample swapping with the active participation and assistance of the FSB, the CSP, and both Moscow and Sochi laboratories. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm willing to take questions, and I've also asked uh, my uh, chief investigator, Martin Dubby, who is on my left, uh, to answer any questions that may arise about some of the investigative work that was done. So I'll turn okay. the situation back to you, uh, Catherine, and uh, you can start with the questions. Excellent. Thank you. Just uh, We'll just go through a few uh, um, uh, housekeeping items before we start with the questions. Uh, we have people on the phone from around the world, so if the operator can line up questions on the phone, what we will do is um, go back and forth from the room to the phone and uh, try to get to as many as we can while we're here. So we're going to start with a question from the room. I'd ask even those on the phone to please identify yourself, your name, and the media outlet you're representing. I have two colleagues in the room with microphones. If you can uh, sort of flag them down. So we'll start with Hayo there um, in the second row, please. Thank you very much. I use Apple German Television, ARD. I have two questions to Richard or to, to Mike. Um, the first one is Thomas Bach, the German IOC president, claimed, uh, based on the, the other findings before, that the Russian NOC has not been involved in cover-up of doping in Russian sports. Uh, according to the report, I see here people who have been representatives or staff members of the Russian NOC. Does it mean that the Russian NOC was also at least with some people involved in that uh, cover-up or doping system? And the second question is, uh, can you specify which uh, sports, other sports, apart from athletics and winter sports, have been involved? Um, or maybe I would add, which sports in winter at the Sochi Games have been involved and which other summer sports? Okay, two very different uh, questions. Uh, turning first to the uh, Russian Olympic Committee. We did some investigative work of the Russian Olympic Committee. Uh, we have had a, a very intense 57 days and uh, there is much more work that could be and needs to be done. Uh, we, can, uh, we did not identify an active role uh, of the Russian Olympic Committee, but I can say this. Uh, there was um, a crossover by the Deputy Minister of Sport, Nagornov, who is on the executive board of the Russian Olympic Committee. Some of the sports that we know are uh, involved in the uh, doping program and receiving drugs uh, through that program the presidents of the national federations of those sports are either on the executive committee of the Russian Olympic Committee uh, or they are a member of the Russian Olympic Committee. And what we don't know is uh, the degree to which they might have knowledge of what was going on within their sport. And that's as far as we, the time and the data we had available to us went in terms of looking at the Russian Olympic Committee. 
I'm sorry, if you would use the mic, please, and I'll answer your point. Yeah. There's a person mentioned in the report. Her name is Rodionova, Irina Rodionova. She is allegedly a staff member, was staff member of the Russian NOC. Uh, yes, uh, you're correct. Uh, she is a member, or was a member rather, and uh, she was uh, directly involved, and that's discussed in the report. That's the only one that is discussed uh, at any length in the report. Uh, and that's, we have, you have in the report all the information we have. Let me turn to your second question. Um, specific uh, sports and uh, athletes. Again, uh, <clears throat> I want to emphasize that the database from which we worked, uh, we had to secure it, translate it, uh, there is, uh, a considerable amount of material that we have made strategic choices not to look at because we only had 57 days to develop this report. So uh, there is work to be done yet. Um, so the statistics, everything we're presenting in the report is a very narrow slice of, of what could be a much larger database that we don't have, uh, which would reveal more. So when you look at the statistics, recognize this is a slice of what's going on, not the total picture, but it does indicate the total picture we have described. So there are uh, most winter sports involved, and there's a table in the report that uh, shows the summer sports that are involved. And while it doesn't include every sport uh, in our table and in the information that we've looked at, and again, I want to emphasize our database is narrow, that it, we do know that every single positive first screen in the Moscow lab was sent up the chain of command and sent an order sent back down. Now that has to affect every single sport uh, across the board, uh, unless there is a sport that has never had a positive, which I would very much doubt is the case. So uh, that's all I can do in terms of answering your question. Okay. Uh, I can't name specific athletes. We were not mandated to do that kind of work in this particular exercise. And um, specific sports, it, it covers the vast majority of the sports. Thank you. Another question from the room. Um, need to get the mic. Yes, yeah, give me the mic. Uh, we'll, go with, we'll go with the first, the, the first uh, row there, and then with you. Good morning, Alex Mihailovich, RT. So I keep hearing that this is all beyond a reasonable doubt. So I, we hope so. But much what, what you're saying is or directly related to Rodachenko. Now, Rodachenko himself is a person who's under investigation in Russia currently. He took off from Russia. He uh, was making allegations or making up stories that he was uh, mixing cocktails of steroids with uh, Shivitz Regal for the boys and with martinis for the girls, which I... I don't, know, I don't know how well that works or doesn't work. I'm not an expert in this field, but he seems to be a character that you really can't rely on, and a lot of this relies on Rodachenko. Also, when you talk about the FSB, the removing caps and their scratches, and you're calling it a highly secretive complex operation, but somehow they're sloppy with those scratches. And again, it seems to be, called, be coming from Rodachenko, all this information. So you're talking about a compromised character, how can you rely so much on this one individual in this case? And also I'd like to ask you as a follow-up question, the um, report that just came out about uh, Russia sh being, should be banned from the Olympics altogether, does this compromise your report? Okay, good question. And uh, I, within the mandate that I was given to investigate uh, and the interviews we did. We conducted an in-person interview, uh, telephone interviews, and Skype interviews with Dr. Rodoshenkov. Uh, he is a central person in this investigation, but not the only person in this investigation. What gave me confidence in uh, what he was saying to me was the forensic and laboratory analytical work, because it corroborates exactly what he was saying to me. The uh, forensic work shows bottles can be uh, tampered with, 
and uh, the analytical results show that the contents of the urine was tampered with because there's excessive salt that human, normal human excretion wouldn't occur. Um, so when I put the forensic and laboratory and other data that we have together and cross-corroborate it with what Dr. Rodoshenkov says, I'm confident that within the context of my mandate, uh, he was telling uh, me the truth and was a uh, truthful witness in respect of that. I recognize that uh, there are other aspects of his life that uh, are um, perhaps not appropriate, but I didn't need to get into that. that, that I have to determine whether he's uh, truthful with respect to what I'm dealing with, my mandate. And I was able to do that, and I was able to corroborate that because of all of the scientific and forensic information. So that's why I can say, without a doubt, beyond a reasonable doubt, uh, he was truthful witness with respect to the contents of what's in our report. And that's all I needed. I didn't need to examine the rest of his life and what else he's done. But I am aware of all of the things that you mentioned. Um, the, the FSB, um, we don't know. Nobody has seen how the Russians opened the bottles. What the investigative team did is we conducted an experiment. And after a considerable amount of work, excellent work by our uh, Marks and Scratches expert, he was able to demonstrate in front of me how to do that. I don't propose to describe that to the world, uh, but I can assure you that I've, uh, I've seen it. I've seen it done and I've inspected it and it can be done and it can be reinserted. We don't know how the Russians did it, but we know that it can be done. We do know the following though. In all of those Sochi samples that were analyzed by marks and scratches, we could see scratch marks left by a tool which would be pushing the ring up to open the bottle. And we could identify those, not with the untrained eye by just visual inspection, but with a trained eye and microscope assistance, you can identify that. And we noticed that in our experiment, we created very similar sorts of marks to the insides of the caps. And so on that basis, uh, I'm confident that while I can't describe the precise methodology they used, they had a methodology that did work, but it left evidence uh, which could be found. And when we did it as an experiment, we had the same marks showing up in our experiments. Um, with respect to the alleged uh, leaks of this report and does it affect the credibility of what was done. I had control of this report and nobody else had control of this report until late Saturday afternoon when it was turned over as arranged and as indicated in the terms of reference to WADA so they could prepare their organization for uh, dealing with this report. Um, <clears throat> the events that seem to have occurred on Saturday predate uh, my turning over the report um, to WADA. And I'm confident that there has been no leak of the uh, water report, uh, of my report whatsoever, and that all that was going on from Saturday until now was rampant speculation uh, uh, by different people uh, and with respect to some document that's apparently leaked. It's not the report, it's a letter written to various people. So I, I don't think it has any impact whatsoever, and I, I pay no attention to it. It did not affect the credibility of this report. Okay, we'll take one more question from the room, and uh, here in the first, in the first row here, yes. gentlemen um, here. Good morning, um, Yuki Oba from NHK Japan Broadcasting. Um, I have two questions for Mr. McLaren. Um, the first one is um, the, the Russian methodology you've confirmed, is it only um, possible on their home ground in Sochi, or is it possible, was it possible outside Russia in other international competitions? And the second one is, um, are you making any recommendations having found out these um, methodology? Um, are you making any suggestions, recommendations towards um, the Rio Olympics or the coming PyeongChang Olympics Games? If not, um, what do you think 
is the appropriate action for the international society to do. Thank you. Um, the disappearing positive methodology was developed for the use of the Moscow lab. It doesn't apply to any other uh, accredited lab anywhere in the world. So it only applies to samples that went through the analytical process of the Moscow lab. It has no impact elsewhere. The, the idea of the mouse hole and the sample swapping at Sochi Games, as I said, it, it, that arises because th there were a number of independent observers that were going to be present in the Sochi lab. So you couldn't falsify the records the way the Moscow lab was doing it. So they had to come up with a new methodology. That's unique to Sochi. I don't think it's going to, we'll ever see that done anywhere else any, any other time. So <clears throat> your answer to your question directly, is there effects elsewhere outside of Russia? I don't believe there is, no. Um, I'm sorry, I, I, I made an incomplete note of your second question. Do you the recommendations. Oh, oh yes, uh, recommendations. My, my job, my mandate was to investigate and provide a report and to establish facts. Uh, it wasn't to make recommendations, uh, and I have not made any recommendations. There are no recommendations in the report. No recommendations have been made. The information is in the report for others to take, absorb, and act on, and uh, not for me to make recommendations about, and I have made none. Okay, we're going to go and see if we can get a question from the phone, and then we'll come back to the room. So, operator, can we have our first question? And we have a question from Martin Ziegler. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, Professor McCann. It's Martin Ziegler from The Times. Hello? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry, yeah. Um, can you, uh, is there any way that... Um, Russia now can um, go to Rio without a, a, a sort of stain of what they've done, that what the, the Russian government has done hanging over them. Well, sir, um, that's a, a conclusion for you and others to make. I put my report out for you to make your own judgment calls, and I have nothing to say on the point. Okay, we'll take one more question from the phone, please, operator. And it's from Eddie Pels. Please go ahead. Uh, Richard, it's kind of a two-parter. I heard you mention the FINA World Championship in 2015, I think. Could, I didn't see that in the report, but maybe I missed it. And then as far as the recommendation that, that you seem to not have much to say about, was that ever on the table that maybe you would make some and then, and then it was decided that you wouldn't, or was that never part of your mandate? The uh, FINA World Championships, uh, we, the, the primary thing that we know about that is that the disappearing positive methodology was, there was a debate internally as to whether or not it ought to continue because don't forget the IC was in place and so that system was operating while the IC was investigating what was going on. There was a, quite an internal debate, and it was ultimately decided that it ought to continue, and it did continue during the FINA championships. But that's all that we really uh, have in the way of information on that subject, uh, and that uh, I deem not to be significant to put in the report. So I didn't put it in the report, but we did have that information. Um, were we ever going to consider recommendations? I certainly started uh, with the thought in mind that I might and would perhaps want to make recommendations. The more I dug into the date detail and the um, databases and the information from interviews and so on, the more I recognized that what was important here was that let's get the facts out, let's get uh, the story correct and firmly established and it's not for me to make recommendations, it's for others to look at the base information and make their decisions. So uh, during the course of the investigation, I decided not to make any recommendations, but it, I did consider it and elected not to do so. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, operator, we'll come back to you. We're gonna take a question here from the front row, Elena. Uh, wait, you need to switch for the microphone, please? Just wait for the microphone, please. Elena Sakalaba, RTR TV. Um, after the leak of, you know, 
of your report or like the idea of US and Canadian uh, anti-doping committees like to pursue to ban Russia from Olympic Games in Rio. Um, the head of Russian Olympic Committee said that, you know, because of that, the investigation may be not objective. Uh, do you think that it's this, you know, um, not your investigation, but all the situation become like not only about the sport, but become more political? And do you see any, you know, like reference to the the time at Cold War of the banning of Moscow Olympic Games, what the station around Rio Olympic Games, because you report just coming before Rio Olympic Games. And the following question is, what would you say to the Russian athletes which were not, you know, like, you know, think they're clean? And because according to this investigation, like everybody used doping. So um, what would be your approach to like for the just, you know, hundreds and hundreds of Russian athletes who wants to participate in the Rio Olympic Games? I, I, first of all, I'd like to uh, start uh, comment on the premise of your question was that the report was leaked. The report was not leaked. Uh, speculation of, uh, and correspondence surrounding it that had nothing to do with me and for which I, I never uh, saw until it was in the public uh, uh, domain via, via the papers on Saturday evening or Sunday. Uh, the, I'm confident the report was not leaked. Um, and what uh, others did was all speculation uh, as to what I've told you this morning. And uh, as you can now see, some of it was completely wrong. Um, the timing just before the games, uh, I, I, I don't think there's anything strategic in that. Uh, the timing actually is caused by uh, information coming into the public domain through Dr. Rodoshenkov and um, the decision being made by WADA to we better conduct an investigation and it's unfortunate that it's on the very eve of the games but I don't think there was any um, strategic plan that it that should be done at that time that's because of the way events unfolded that's the way it occurred and if I had my druthers, I would have much preferred to have continued this investigation for a number of more weeks because there is much more, I think, that we could say, uh, but we just didn't have the time. So, And we didn't have the time because we knew we had to report because of the pending Rio games. Uh, <clears throat> so I think that answers that question. Uh, a question about uh, clean athletes. Um, uh, that's a, an unfortunate uh, consequence, I suppose, of a system uh, that was operating, that uh, there are athletes who are hurt uh, by their uh, non-participation. Uh, they're hurt in many ways. Uh, you know, they perhaps don't get the best coaches. They uh, aren't able to compete at the highest national competitions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, um, for those who are operating as real sports pe people, sports persons, I feel sorry for them, but um, I think it's still my obligation to put forward the facts uh, of what was going on, which I'm sure they will be as disappointed in as I am. Okay, another question from the room. Uh, Rebecca, over there in the... Right. Hi, thank you very much. Rebecca Ruiz from the New York Times. Two questions. I apologize in advance for hammering on the question of recommendations. You have been a part of past independent commissions um, appointed by WADA, and similarly, you've uncovered substantial facts, a lot of information. Why is this situation different from past circumstances when you have made strong recommendations for WADA to decertify Rosada, for the lab? to be stripped of its accreditation. Second question, ahead of the games, given that you now have observed that these bottles that are the standard at international competition can be broken into, do you think it is appropriate to use those bottles in Rio? Thank you. Um, well, I don't have anything further to say on the question of recommendations. I already answered that question. I don't man and plan to repeat my answer. Uh, with respect to the uh, bottles, uh, 
I did not uh, make any uh, recommendations there either, but uh, I think the information should be clear. The bottles are what you could describe as being tamper evident. The experiments uh, that we conducted and the activity that the Russians conducted left tampering marks, uh, which can be identified. So I think with relatively easy training, people can identify uh, if there is any problems with samples in Rio. So I would not say that the bottles at Rio are in jeopardy. Okay, we'll take a question from the, oper uh, from the phone operator. Our next question. And we have a question from Kevin Nutley. Please go ahead. Hello, Kevin Nutley from Around the Rings. The way the report's written, it seems to put all of the onus and the blame on the you know, state-sponsored program. Is there no culpability of the athletes in this case? Well, we were uh, looking at the evidence to make a report about what was going on. So we, w we were not looking at specific athletes and, and their participation in the program. So uh, there no, there's no discussion of that and there's no conclusions about that. Okay, next question from the phone. Operator? And we have a question from Eddie Goldman. Thank you very much. It's Eddie Goldman of No Holds Barred. I would like to know if there was actual evidence that you saw that some of the Russian athletes who tested positive were forced to dope and forced to be part of this state-sponsored program. In the work that I did as the independent person uh, investigation, uh, that was not part of our mandate and we did not deal with that. But as a member of the commission and the independent commission, uh, we did uh, find evidence from that work that athletes who didn't participate in the program, didn't get access to the best coaches, did not uh, have the opportunity to compete at the highest levels of the national competition structure etc. And in that sense, they might feel coerced into the system because if they didn't participate in the doping programs, then they, they wouldn't have access to the different things I just described. But that was not part of our mandate. We didn't spend time doing that part of our work. Uh, we did it on the things I've reported on. Okay. Thank I'll take you. Another, another question from the room here on, on my left. Hi. Uh, this Go, ahead. Is on Go ahead. Hey, Richard. Uh, Jamie Strachan uh, with uh, CBC. I was just wondering, um, since a lot of uh, these allegations have come forward, there's been a, a look at kind of uh, what's changed uh, in Russia, how uh, outside uh, investigators are being, are being treated there. Um, throughout the course of your uh, investigation, did you uncover any evidence as to what has actually changed uh, on the ground uh, in Russia when it comes to the culture uh, of doping. And the second question I had is you said that this report is just a thin uh, slice uh, of what's out there. Could you uh, talk a little bit about what you would have liked uh, to have included in this report had you had more time and what some of that, uh, the remaining piece of the pie is, if you will? Thank you. Uh, to your first question, I don't think I really have much uh, comment to uh, the culture and, and the investigation uh, of Russia. Um, I really don't have anything to say on that point. On your second question, um, what I said, the report isn't a thin slice. I said is that the data that we have in the report that shows and demonstrates this is a thin slice of uh, the total data. and. We don't have access to that total data. We would have to have been given access to computer hardware information within the Russian Federation, and that did not happen. Also, there are many other sources of data that we don't have and have never been able to secure. So we're looking at what we have and reporting on the basis of that, but we're confident that what we have describes accurately what's going on. And what we do have, because we only had 57 days to do it, and of course it took us a great deal of time to get the data, um, 
bring back to life all of the deleted documentation that's in the uh, database so that we could look at apparently deleted documents. And then the very first thing we had to do was say, with our Russian translator, uh, give us a broad outline of what's there and should we go into that more deeply, should we move on to the next piece. And uh, so we skimmed the surface uh, in examining some of the data and went into it in more detail where we thought it was appropriate making strategic decisions. What I would, uh, in an ideal world, what, what would I like to have done is a great deal more work with that database that we do have, um, but we simply didn't have the time to do that. So we had to draw a line on the investigation. We actually got some very important information in as recently as Friday of this past week. There was simply no possible time to do any investigative analysis of that information in one day when you're writing a report as major as this report. So we have it. We'd like to look at that subsequently. We probably will look at that subsequently. So that, uh, I think, covers. OK, we'll go back to the phone. Operator, can we have our next question? Once again, if you do have a question, press star then one on your touch tone phone. OK. Well, while we're waiting for the people on the phone, we'll stay here uh, on the, in the first row here. Hi, Carrie Gillespie from the Toronto Star. I'm wondering if you can go back to Sochi and talk about how many medals may have been compromised and across how many sports, given what you've, the slice that you have found. Uh, we didn't actually go into tallying that up and trying to identify that, so I can't comment on it. Sorry. Even just some sense, would it have been across every sport? Right. I, 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 I'm going to defer to my chief investigator and let him answer that question. There are a number of medal winners involved. Oh. Oh. Keep your hand. There are a number of uh, medal winners involved, uh, but not specific numbers at this stage. Okay, do we have a question on the, on the phone now? We do have one from uh, Phil Hirsch. Please go ahead. Uh, this is just, <clears throat> just a minor point of clarification. Well, the, on the chart listing the sport by sport positives that were uh, not reported properly, does skating refer to all of the skating sports, speed skating, figure skating, short track? Martin? Yes. Yeah. The answer is yes. Okay. And there's no, specific, no breakdown of that by sport? Now, we didn't try to do that. All right, we're going to take one more question from the floor. Somebody who hasn't, uh, there we go, in the front row here, this lady here. Hello, my name is Alexandra Timon. I'm uh, representing NTV, Russian TV channel. And uh, my first question is why uh, WADA is so focused on Russia? Uh, so why Russia has been singled out? And my second question is, um, uh, why didn't you work with the Russian side during your investigation? This investigation is very important for us. Uh, the, result, uh, the results might uh, uh, be that uh, our team uh, won't be represented during uh, the Olympics. So, and you say that you had only 57 days for this report and you didn't have enough time to gather enough proof. But uh, this is very, very important for us. Thank you. I agree, it is very important. And, and it's a very serious subject matter for us as well, and we didn't take our, our job lightly in uh, reporting. Uh, if you think that Russia has been singled out and why did WADA do that, I think those are questions you ought to direct to WADA, not to me. I was assigned to do an investigation, I did that, uh, and that investigation involved Russia. Uh, your question about, well, why did, uh, why was Russian ministry officials and others not uh, interviewed. We, I was a member of the IC, and uh, we did uh, that. I in interviewed, for example, uh, Minister Mutko, along with my colleagues on the IC. And we found the, that information and the, that process singularly unhelpful. Uh, and then, with respect to um, witnesses, we tried to encourage people within the Russian Federation to come forward, um, but for a variety of reasons which would be personal to them, 
they were not uh, prepared to do so, and, and um, they were concerned for their own personal safety or other reasons, and so they didn't come forward, um, and so I wasn't able to put questions to people uh, in Russia, and I simply didn't have the time to do that, knowing that it was not very helpful when we did it the last time when we had more time with the IC, so that's why I didn't do it. Uh, and again, longer time I would have done it, um, but wasn't helpful the last time. I didn't anticipate any change this time. Okay. Well, that's all we have time for today. Um, uh, just a reminder, uh, we have copies of Professor McLaren's statement available as you're leaving today. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This concludes today's conference. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.